Hello, welcome to the table. My name is Jonathan Hicks. I'm Steve Rain. I'm Mark Wynn. And this is my top 10 games of all time. So I've been doing my top 30. We've done uh, like three videos. This is the third video. So we did 30 down to 21 in the first video, 20 down to 11 in the second video. And now it's time for the top 10. So if you haven't seen the previous two videos, do watch those. You can see the games that almost made it into my top 10, but not quite. Uh, but this is the best ones. These are the best 10 games in the world ever, in my opinion. <laughs> Um, now you two have both been making lists as well, haven't you? We had five minutes, yeah. I've got ten games written down here. So you're guessing the games that you <laughs> think are going to be in my top ten? Somewhere, yeah. I'm going to have a little competition to see which of you gets I, I think I have an unconfident nine. Oh, <laughs> okay. That's a lot. That's a lot. Um, so yes, we'll see how many they get right. <laughs> okay, let's get to it. Number ten. Oh goody, it's number ten. This one is technically a replacement. Terra Mystica has been on my list for many years. I love it. It's a great game. Um, but uh, I think it, this the replacement is Gaia Project, obviously, if you're not familiar with it. And it came out just too late to make my list last year. So it's definitely on my list this year. Um, it kind of does everything that Terra Mystica does. And it's a really interesting game. I find the mechanics, the way the different things interact, is just really involving. So this kind of trans sports it into space. So instead of different kinds of territories, you've got different planets in space and you're kind of terraforming them. So you have a particular kind of planet that you like to live on, the yellow planets, for example, and you're trying to turn these all different colored planets into your color planets. And then you colonize them and stick various buildings and things on them. Um, but it's really quite abstract despite all that. Um, there's some great little uh, sort of tech trees almost. If you build this building, you can upgrade it to this building, which then upgrades to this kind of building which unlocks this extra ability that you get. And there's an awful lot of comboing of different actions. And it's one of those games that when you first play it, you can do very badly indeed. It can be very hard to get resources. You can find out you run out really quickly until you start to see how the different elements of the game really fit together. And then you can do amazingly well. So the difference between not really knowing what you're doing and someone who knows what they're doing is phenomenal. Like you'll get completely whitewashed by somebody who's, uh, who knows what they're doing far more than you do. Um, but this, I mean, I didn't really think they could improve on Terra Mystica, but it is better. In a few key ways, they've improved on the system. Um, so I am always have to play Guy Project, and it gets played loads at the cafe, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. There's quite a few people who I think like it even more than me, because um, they're often wanting to play it again and again and again. It was my, if you haven't seen my video, it was a bit slightly higher on my video. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's amazing. I think it has replaced Terra Mystica. Yeah. Terra Mystica is still a great game. If, yeah. if Guy Project mm -hmm. was not around... Like I went to a different place where there's no access to Gaia Project and so I said, do you want to play Terra I'm like, yeah, sure, I do love that game. Yeah. Um, but it, Gaia Project is just significantly better. Mm. It's just tighter. It's more unified the way they, the other things yeah. are done better. I think for me also the races are stronger, as in they are they're more, more interesting. To yeah, learn. they're more different, aren't yes. they, than each other. And um, the tech tree as well, mm. there's, a, there's a reason to go up on specific tech tracks, which gives you bonuses. I just like, I mean, it comes from Terra as well, just the income. I've built out my board, the more I build, the more little hands under little coins or resources yes. I get. Um, that's just a nice thing. If you want, if you're into heavy Euros and you've not played this one, this is one of the best heavy Euros out there, hands down. I think almost every heavy Euro fan out there would rate Guy Project very highly. It just, I couldn't really fault it. It's a fantastic game. Unbelievable. It's number nine. This one was on my list last year and is another heavy Euro and it's just a few places higher, I think, which is The Voyages of Marco Polo. Uh, it's a fantastic game. Are we getting a tick for that one? Uh, it's really, really tight and really easy to do very badly at. Uh, effectively, it's a kind of dice placement game. So you're placing dice in different spots to take different actions. But money, for instance, is super tight. And in theory, there's a... Um, a uh, traveling mechanism, um, a bit like my mind's gone blank. What's the uh, popular train game? Ticket to Ride. Ticket to Ride. <laughs> <laughs> a bit, I know, I don't know why I blanked on that. <laughs> Most famous game ever. But you're trying to get to a couple of key objectives by moving around on this map, but traveling is so hard. You need to spend camel to, certain, to travel across certain areas and money to travel across other areas, and you never have enough of it either. But again, it's one of those that when you learn to play the game very well, you can kind of um, combine different actions in such a way to benefit from extra actions and get all the traveling done that you need. 
Um, it took me four or five plays before I actually got a decent score. I was doing very badly at this the first few times I played, but every time it brought me back, it's like, I need to beat this game, regardless of what anyone else's score is. Um, and I still really love it. Um, the faction powers are crazy, and you always think everyone else is better than theirs, as we always say whenever we talk about the game, but it's a fantastic package. I seconded. It. It's great. It's brilliant. Love it. It was on your list, was yeah, it? Yeah, about the same place. Mm, okay. God, 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 if, you've, if you've seen mine before, Jonathan's, it should, shouldn't be spoiled. I'm going to stop doing that. Because <laughs> if uh, you haven't seen mine yet, yeah, I'm spoiling things. Mm. Yeah, I agree with everything spoken about it. If it, uh, it would still be a decent enough game without the powers, but for me, the powers elevate it much beyond other games of that similar sort of style. I will second that. You always say this, don't you? But there's one power that lets you, instead of rolling the dice and then placing them, you can just pick whatever you like for the numbers on the dice, which seems like the most amazing power ever. But it's not the best power. You know, you often draft them, so you get to choose the yeah, dice at the start. I've seen it not being picked before with four players. That's amazing. <laughs> <laughs> it just seems so overpowered, doesn't it? Oh gosh, it's number eight. All right, we've had a spate of euros, uh, but this one is packed with theme, and that is War of the Ring. In fact, I have, I don't know if you can see behind Mark, but the uh, collector's edition, the giant box there, is one of the reasons why I think this is significantly higher this year on my list, because it's a fantastic version of the game. Uh, it's huge, it barely fits on this table. It's like the board comes in two giant pieces, tons and tons of pre-painted miniatures. Uh, I've been playing quite a bit with my son, and he loves Lord of the Rings, and we both really get into it. It's a fantastic game anyway, but the components and the theme that surrounds it really do make a difference to me. So playing with a great version of the game really improves my enjoyment of the game, if you like. Um, but essentially one person takes the goodies, um, the Fellowship of the Ring, if you like. They're trying to get the ring to Mount Doom and destroy it. Whereas the other side um, takes the baddies, the forces of evil, Mordor and all that stuff. And they're trying to kind of stop the Fellowship getting through, but also conquer lots of different territories. Generally, the bad player wins by um, defeating like 10 victory points worth of cities or yeah. strongholds. Um, it's just a, a two-player war game, but it's one of the best out there. In fact, it might be my all-time favourite two-player war game. It does the theme so well. There's so many interesting mechanics. You're rolling dice and then using the dice to take actions. There's multi-use cards, so you can use cards in combat, or you can use cards kind of out of combat for the special abilities. And a lot of the time you're like, oh, this is great for combat, but this other ability is really going to help me if I use it right now. When should I play it? So there's a lot of interesting decisions all the way through. It's really, really good. Hmm? I haven't played Usually, it, so I'll let Mark go. So this is um, yeah, I, I, I raced it very high in, my, in my last top 13. It'll still do well this year, but... Um, yeah, the thing I like about most is that it's a game about pressure points. If I'm applying pressure over here, I can't do it over here, and vice yeah. versa. And it's it's one of the few games I can think of where you're you're never making a huge change, but it's the loads of little tiny things add up. Little just thing, a little bit of good luck occasionally away, or doing the right thing just a particular th situation. It's just tiny, tiny steps that make the difference. Not. There is no, or very rarely, huge everything all in moment, and this changed the game, and that yeah. was how the game was won. It's I'm just I've been pushing that those few units just a little bit further around the board, just making you stretch your army just that little bit too far and stuff like that. And that's what makes it really good because you can slowly just see them build up. Yeah, it's amazing how balanced it is, mm. despite the fact that the two sides are radically yeah. different. It's hugely asymmetric. I remember we had this one game. Mark was playing the bad guys. And I really thought I was going to win. I kind of everything was in place, but then I just miscalculated. The map is really interesting. It's not like hexes or squares mm -hmm. or anything. They're kind of irregularly shaped areas. Mm -hmm. And so, if an army is going to travel from one place to another place to conquer the territory, you have to think quite carefully about if it goes this route, it's five spaces. Oh, but this route, it's four spaces. But maybe if I block this with a unit, it's going to take him an extra turn to get there, kind mm -hmm. of thing. So there's a lot of interesting thoughts about that, and I just mistimed it. So I thought he couldn't get his army into this one stronghold, but then he tried to play the cards and things like, oh, he can do it. He gets <laughs> the stronghold. I'm just about to destroy the ring, but no, and he managed to conquer the stronghold, and I just lost. But it always feels tight, um, and that's amazing considering how much is going off in the game. You know, it's a pretty complicated game, but very well balanced. Crikey, it's number seven. 
This next one is another big thematic uh, dudes on a map game, I suppose, and that's Rising Sun, which is um, it's from um, Eric M. Lang, and he generally does that kind of game really well, but I feel like Rising Sun is the pinnacle of his sort of designing achievements. It combines Euro mechanisms in a way that still feels like a great run around with your big monsters on the map conquering territories. One thing I really like about it though, which solves uh, a fundamental issue with many of these kind of war games, which is that someone can just get picked on. Someone can get a big army and just keep stomping on the same person because they need this territory or that territory or whatever it is. But in Rising Sun, you're getting points, which is how you win the game, not for conquering the most territories necessarily, but you need to conquer different territories each round. You're effectively getting a token for each of the different territories. And if you've already conquered one territory, there's really no incentive for you to conquer that territory again, or a very small one. So having just maybe beaten someone up and won a fight in one area, for the next round, you're going to leave them alone and go off somewhere else because you've already conquered the territory. And it just works so well. It means no one really feels out of it. Um, there's lots of really nice mechanisms in terms of um, combats like hidden behind a screen and you can spend money in different places to give you extra benefits during the combat. Um, the miniatures are fantastic and it's great as well as you're having your army and moving your army around the back of uh, the map you're getting potentially these big monsters as I say Japanese um, sort of fantasy monsters that you're adding um, which can help you in battle and they have got some really interesting special abilities that can swing the battle. It's not just I'm a really big tough monster and I'm going to kill all units. Um, it's things that potentially get you extra victory points or things that you actually want to lose possibly in the battle because then the monster comes back somewhere else or there's all kinds of interesting mechanisms and you only play with a subset each time. So the game feels very different each time you play it because you're having a different set of cards that bring out different kinds of monsters. The factions feel very different as well. The special powers for each faction are powerful and quite unique. So I always have a blast every time I play it. In terms of dudes on a map games, I think this is my favorite. Uh, me too, yeah. uh, but it's not a genre I really like, I guess. Yeah. Um, <coughs> the, uh, the Each faction plays differently in that you have to tailor your game to your faction strength. Um, if this faction, the turtle faction, you need to focus on kind of making sure you're using the, the moving strongholds and uh, the faction that can fly anywhere as well. You can kind of carry it like, uh, Sneak in at the end, yeah. I fly lots of troops in. Um, it's really good, it's really nice for all the reasons Jonathan said. My favorite point is the hidden combat. There are four actions you can take which will do various things in the battle, get you points for this or taking hostages for that. But only the person who puts the most coins on each one will get to take the action. Mm. Um, so I, I'm he's got a bigger army than me, but if I can outguess him here, um, I can swing the battle in my favor, or if I can do it in such a way that. Um, especially in a three-way fight, mm. that becomes interesting. In my, in my three-way fight, I know I'm going to lose, but what can I get out of this fight by putting my coins on in the right place? Because you can kill your own guys, can't you? Yeah. Kind of commit honourable seppuku, whatever it's called, and you get lots of points for it. Yeah. So, and as you say, sometimes you really want to do that. So in some games, you know, it's like, oh, there's no way I can beat this, and you just sort of lose heart. But in this, it's like, oh, it doesn't matter if I don't win the fight. I need to get as many points as I can out of this fight. Or make sure you work out the, the the way to get the most coins for a later fight. That's oh, why, because yes. the, pe the people who don't win then get the winner's value they put they played in split in half. Yeah, whatever they spent which, gets distributed. So you kind of like, well, I want some of that money for later. So if I egg up, then I'm going to throw a load in. They're going to put loads in, and then they give me loads of money, and then I'm I'm it's good for the, late in the round. The battles happen in an order. Yes, so you're the one through seven, and you know what the order is at the start of the round. And it's different yep. each round. So you know that this battle's happening yeah. last. So if I get in this battle and I can try and get money from people from other battles, yeah. I know I've got a good chance of winning this last one. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes just being in the battle just to get some money. Even yeah. if you've got a little single dude can make all the difference. Now I know you like this, but I don't think you liked it that much. Yeah, and we've played it a bit more recently and I just I thought about what games do I really want to play the most? And this just kept popping up in my mind. I was like, yeah. Really like it, really want to play it again. And so, it's number six. All right, so we're back to Euro territory, and the next one's been on my list for a few years now, and it's Russian Railroads. And there's an expansion for it, which half of the expansion is great, and I highly recommend playing with it. The other half, I could take or leave. But even without the expansion, I'd still really happily play this one. 
Uh, it's a train game that has no theme at all, really. But for some reason it doesn't bother me, and I think that's just because the mechanics work so well. You're kind of trying to advance bits of track of different colours. They're not even good colours, it's like black and grey and brown. And, but um, it's so interesting the way the different mechanisms fit together. Um, so it's a worker placement game, you're big board in the middle, you stick your guys in various places and you take various actions. So some will move the black track along, some will move the brown track along. Um, but you can get engineers, which gives you own personal actions, which I really like. It's like, if I get this one, then I've got this action no one else can use, which is fantastic. Um, there's, you're scoring points at the end of each round, according to effectively how far each of the different tracks you've managed to move are, as well as you kind of buy trains, and the, the bigger the number on the train, the further it runs along the track, and the more points you get. But it keeps building and building, so whatever point score you score at the end of the first round, you're guaranteed to score that at the end of the second round, and more depending on how far you've moved all the various bits. So to start with, you're scoring like four or five points around, but by the final round, you're scoring like 100 or so <laughs> points per round. So it really builds and builds and builds. Um, the only perhaps slight downside to it, I'd say, is that if someone gets a lead, it's very hard to catch them. Depending on the strategy they take, it might be possible if you've gone for a kind of a long-term strategy, but generally, Steve is usually out by ahead of me oh, no, by a few no. points uh, after a couple of rounds, and I'm like, oh, I'm going to struggle to catch him at this point. <laughs> um, I have I have won this. Mark M- M- catches me because he sometimes goes down the white. Track I do a very specific. Yeah, and the white the, the white track route. If you get the white track on your last round, that's how you get the biggest score. So you, you yeah. will nearly always outscore me on the last round, and I just need to be. <laughs> I just need to be further. But that further, makes it quite fun though, because yeah. I'm you know that I'm yeah, coming, yeah. but am I coming good enough? <laughs> That strategy <laughs> wins if there was one more round always. Yes, but that's why it's yeah, well balanced. Yeah. yeah, it is very well balanced. It's very tight. Yeah, Like any good work placement, you never quite get stuck. I really want that spot, and that spot, and that spot, but you know you're not going to get them. Yeah, there's three people before me, and I want for any, any of these two will do. Any, okay, any of those two will do. Okay, I need that one. Please don't go there. <laughs> <laughs> it's gone. And they all go. Marvellous. It's number five. This is my all-time favourite Euro at the moment, and remarkably enough, it's a Stefan Feld game, and that is the Oracle of Delphi, yeah. which is a very unusual Stefan Feld game because there are no points. Usually every Stefan Feld game is a point salad, but this one is about racing around on a kind of map of Greek islands, if you like. So you have your little boat, and you sail from island to island, trying to complete the 12 tasks of Zeus, is mm-hmm. it? So it, none of the things really entice me if you describe them to me. So there's quite a bit of pick up and deliver. You get cubes from this place and drop them somewhere else. You get statues, statues from yeah. here and you drop them over there. There's some monsters you can go and fight. Um, but it's one thing he always does very well is use of dice. And this game uses it extremely well. So you kind of roll your dice at the beginning of each round and you're using the dice to take different actions. But it's all color coded, if you like. So if I even just moving around on the sea, the different spots of the sea are color coded. So if I want to go to this spot, I might need to use a yellow dice. Or if I want to fight a red monster, I need to use a red dice. Or if I want to pick up a green cube, I need a green dice. So I really like the way the colors interact and you can use them for all kinds of different things. And that's what makes it so interesting because with this one green dice, I could fight the green monster, I could travel to this green space, I could pick up this green cube, <gasps> what do I do? And that's just one of the dice. You get three dice each round to use, like all the different combinations, it's like I could do that and that, or oh, but then I don't have the right kind of dice for this, or maybe this and this. There are ways to mitigate the dice rolls, you know, um, if you can change the colour on the dice to another one that's next to it, for instance. Like Steffenfeld always does very well, he's great at finding ways of mitigating bad rolls, if you like. But it is very much an exercise in efficiency. You need to get all your different tasks completed in the most efficient way. Because whoever completes them and races back to Zeus first is the winner. It's great. It's such a weird game to play with all these mechanisms and there's no victory points. Mm. It's just a victory condition. Um, for a Stefan Feld game, that is unusual. And it is my favourite Stefan Feld game as well. Mm. As you knew that. I forgot that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm, I like it. I don't love it. Uh, but I do like the parry for the dice, like on the right hand side, and st- on, the, uh, on the on the on the separate board, and when you can trigger the bonuses and stuff. I think that yeah. comboing those in and timing them well is very yeah. important, so you, you which can, makes it more a lot. You get fun. you get the three dice. Yeah. But you can complete five tasks in a turn. It's great. Yeah. Well, I never. It's number four.
The next one is, it was a huge, very successful Kickstarter that came out a couple of years ago now, and they had a sort of reprint last year. And uh, it's a sprawling kind of choose your own adventure game with a map element to it. And that's the seventh continent, mm -hmm. which I think you've probably both guessed. Uh, it's a fantastic game, and particularly because it gives you such freedom of choice. It is very much like a choose your own adventure book. It's like you get to here, do you go here or do you go there? Except it happens on a map. So the map is sort of lots of different cards. So you put your sort of traveling uh, guy on one of the cards, and you can decide to go this way or that way, and then you reveal another card. But it's not random. It's a pre-existing, pre-planned continent. Um, but there's all kinds of things that you can do. So you can, when you trigger certain things, without wanting to give away spoilers, it can potentially change the actual terrain type, and you can discover new things on the current terrain. So maybe there's a cave there that wasn't there before, for example. Uh, one of the things that's really nice, though, is the kind of action card system. So you have cards that you're playing to do various things, typically when you want to go to a new location or you have to complete tests, if you like, and you've got to play the cards to overcome the test. Um, but at the same time, your cards represent your health or it's like your energy level, how much effort you're expending to achieve these different tasks. And if you spend too much energy, you become too weak, then potentially you can die if you don't get enough food. You know, you need to try and find food around on the continent in various places, which replenishes your cards back in. So that mechanism of your cards is your kind of health and your energy, mm. but also the things you need to take the actions with, it works really well. You know, without that mechanism, I think I'd still really enjoy the game. But actually, it's a really innovative mechanism. I've not seen it used anywhere else. And it makes for some really interesting decisions. Um, there's some nice, you know, when the cards come out, um, you know the kind of Where's Wally thing where you're trying to spot the little <laughs> hidden <laughs> things, <laughs> Unlocked things well. Easter yeah. eggs, that kind of thing. You're really looking for them on every card because, again, when you find them, potentially it changes the card that comes out and you might find something there that wasn't there before. So it's a great package. I found it quite challenging. Mm. Uh, it's, I find we die more often than not. But a, I've got a bunch of sort of expansions and scenarios to play through with this, um, but always really enjoy it. I think that's sort of game you need to you need to fail more than you succeed. It keeps you coming back. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it is the best of this sort of game, the kind of choose your own adventure game. There is, a, <clears throat> I think, if you go to a tile and you do a certain thing, it tells you to replace that tile with another one, and you yeah. either and so on. But there are several tiles in the slot, and you pick the front one, don't you? And then when you reset it, you put it at the back. Yeah, so for some things... Yeah, so next, if you if you do the same adventure again and you do this exact same thing, you'll be picking a different tile out. So the first time you might injure yourself, the second time you might find something good. And yeah. you don't you don't know. You could, you could just injure yourself every time you go, though, and you don't know that. You don't know that you're going to get exactly the same or exactly different things every time you go to these places. Which is great, because even though the map is fixed to a certain extent, the encounters are potentially different, mm -hmm. and it's huge. So even though it is fixed, you can decide to go off in a different direction and have a completely different set of adventures. Yeah, this was weird with me. I think the game is amazing, but it has two things that keep knocking with me. First, I actually disagree with Steve on this one. The problem is with, I think, it's going to be tricky so that you don't, so that, to have the challenge. But I'm not sure I want to fail on a, a cult that I'm 12, 13 hours in and then have to start from the start length again. Is there, isn't it? Yeah, and so I think when I've played it, I've just accepted it and just because I've got enough scenario, I've got like seven in the base box, including the three. Yeah, yeah. I'm happy if I go, because they say it's a lot, I'm happy to go through all seven individually like that and then accept I don't want to go to the start again because I'm gonna, otherwise I'm going to see 10 hours of the stuff I've already seen. Okay. Kind of, which kind of reminds me a bit of um, Time Stories where you loop back and it's like. I've already done this. Okay. <laughs> My other issue with it is that I hate the save system. And I know why it's in there, because the length. But you are at a disadvantage to save oh, because okay. you have you to re Because you clear all the tiles, which means you've got to rediscover them. While if the tiles are out on the, on the board, you can spend a uh, cost that's on the, the terrain type just to jump between. So ultimately, it's always better for you not to save yeah, and right. that goes against my like I don't really know what's the best thing to do so you always gonna end up going I want to just do it in one run or yeah. leave it out to continue so it's the sort of game that you'd have under a table top. yes <laughs> yes exactly yes or just set it up and play it every night yeah. in the week until you get to it but other than that it's absolutely amazing and it offers something that's very hard to find out and it does it just mm. so very very well
Yeah, if you get a chance to play, you can't get this in retail, unfortunately. You can only get it through the Kickstarters. Um, but yeah, if you know someone who's got a copy, I'd highly recommend you try this one. It's uh, one of my all-time favourites. Extraordinary. It's number three. This one really is one of the dungeon crawlers that really got me into kickstarting. Certainly, it was the first Kickstarter I ever backed. Um, but also just the kind of epic campaign dungeon crawlers. Uh, it's my favourite by far, and that's Myth, uh, which is... I've got big piles of it up there. Um, it is still... Because it's a few years old now, and I've played a lot of different dungeon crawlers over the years, um, but I still keep coming back to this one because I think of the card play system. Uh, it's cooperative, and you take your character, and you kind of go through the dungeon, killing the monsters and getting the treasure. All of that is fairly standard. But each of the characters is very different and it works through playing a deck of cards. You're not rolling dice in this one. In order to do any kind of action, you play the card to do the action. Actually, having said that, you do roll dice to resolve combat. Um, but in terms of doing most things, you need to be able to play the right kind of card. Uh, and a lot of the time, the, just the difficulties in terms of hand management make the game really thinky. So although it, the miniatures are great, I think, really like the artwork in this one, um, it's an engaging dungeon crawler, but it adds that whole level of I really want to play this card, but it combos really well with this other card that I haven't drawn yet. The decks are actually fairly small and you cycle through them, so it's like quite a lot of deck management. Am I better just playing this just to cycle through my deck a bit in order to get the two cards to work really well together? But right now, I really need to kill this monster or we're going to get splatted. So maybe I just need to play this card just to clear this monster out of the way. Lots of interesting decisions like this one. I played it a lot with my son. Um, I like the story that they attach to a lot of the different missions um, and there's loads and loads of expansions for it. Again, it's difficult to get hold of because it's a Kickstarter, um, but if you manage to get a chance to try this one, as I say, I really enjoy it. It's a very combat heavy dungeon call off, though, right? You do always say yes. you enter a new zone, kill a whole thing, enter a new zone. But yeah, but, uh, I, yeah I agree. I think, if again, it's one of those games, if it didn't have the hand management, I don't think it would be as good as it is, but I think that's what carries it above the, the card play and hand manage is, is so strong in it compared it just adds that extra dimension to it that's just makes it more interesting than the standard i walk here i hit something that's right i move along you get there's just a bit more game going on there because if you i think you can move like two spaces a turn mm. which is hardly anywhere yeah unless you're playing cards there are cards that you move a lot further than that but you need to have the move card at the right time but a lot of that when you first play the game, it can feel like, well, the cards just didn't come out in the right order. I was just unlucky, and that's why we died. But actually, with the more you play it, the more you realize what the strategy of managing your deck and the card mm. draws is, and then you can do a lot better. Got played it. Played it. <laughs> Recurring theme. Yes. <laughs> ah, spiffing. It's number two. And number two is another game that's sort of a dungeon crawler, except it doesn't really involve a dungeon, and it feels different enough from a dungeon crawler, but it is a similar kind of co-op, kill monsters, get treasure, level up. It's the best one out there, hands down, and that's too many bones. And this is sort of a slight replacement this year because they brought out a standalone expansion for too many bones called Undertow, and it's fantastic. The character leveling up system is really really interesting so you have a kind of um, neoprene mat with spaces for dice and you can slot them in various places and each time you level up you get to add an extra dice that might improve one of your stats so it might increase your health or your attack or it might give you an extra ability somehow and then typically when you're in combat you take the dice you've unlocked and you roll them uh, it's very abstract and thinky the combat really it just takes mm -hmm. place on a grid and you have um stacks of poker chips that's chip theory games who publishes it is their kind of signature thing is they use poker chips for everything so the heroes are poker chips and you have little red poker chips under each thing so you can tell by the height of the stack how much health each of the units have which is a really nice way of doing it so you kind of move your units around on this little grid as i say and attack but it's a lot to think about the different monsters have got a wide range of special abilities so monsters will attack two things at once uh, some things will only attack them if they're next to them. And so the planning required and the cooperation between the other people you're playing with is very high. And that's what keeps bringing me back, I think. It, it, you really need to think very carefully about your decisions. If you just rush in, it's like, oh, yeah, I'll just move here and hit this, you'll probably die very quickly. So it's a kind of thinking man's dungeon crawler, mm. if you like. Um, but yes, it's just so satisfying when you level up. And it's like you have this huge set of dice to potentially pick from. It's like, oh, do I do this? Or this, there's like tracks, this dice will unlock this one for next time, but you can never get it all. You know, in one sort of set of missions, 
you're never going to unlock everything by any means. You'd be lucky if you get half of it out. Um, and the characters feel so different. Uh, and the expansion adds an extra two characters and a third one if you get the sort of add-on for it. Um, and again, they feel really different as well. Um, the expansion adds a couple more mechanisms to it, but it's a lot, it's a smaller package than the original Too Many Bones. And as I say, it's standalone and it's a great place to jump on. So if you've not played Too Many Bones and you don't want to spend a hundred plus pounds getting mm. the base game and the add-ons, you can just get the Undertow standalone expansion and it kind of gives you the whole flavor of Too Many Bones in a smaller and cheaper package. How many characters are in the new version? Two in the base, yeah. but there's like an add-on extra character for the standalone so it's slightly, Yeah, just slightly, yeah. Yeah, I've played it with you. I think it's one of those games I think about at the moment I do want to play it again at some point, but because I haven't played it in quite a while, and I just remember the levelling system being so good. But even more so than that, I'm coming back to how cooperative that combat is. Because um, it does feel like a little tactical miniatures go to some extent. Yeah, yeah. Obviously, there's no miniatures, but the way that you move around the, on a map. But it's a tactical one where we're all doing people at the same kind of the same time. We need to like combo our stuff together. We know that it's yeah. like, is that threat the biggest threat? And we all, there's so much discussion that goes into such a small combat field. And that makes it, it's just. You're constantly enthralled with it. You, it's like this combat went on for forty-five minutes, and it feels like it's gone three and five because you just you're just thinking constantly, and that's yeah. really really important. It feels almost like playing a Euro, doesn't it? Yeah, <clears throat> because there's so much interconnected mechanism you need to think about in terms of all the monster abilities, but it's so thematic. The theme's great. I played it. <laughs> <laughs> I th so I think a lot of these big. Heavy thematic games I haven't played, you never bring to the cafe. No, I don't. They, they're, they're, they're played at your house or Mark's house. Yeah. So I will invite people over potentially <laughs> to play them here. But they're just... So I haven't even had... I don't think, without me asking to play them, I don't think I've even had the chance to play something. You brought Seventh Constant to the cafe, so I tried it. Yeah. But like all these other ones you've been mentioning, I just... I actually think you would enjoy Too Many Possibly. Bones yeah. because it is so Euro-y in the way you have to approach combat. And I'll come around and play it one day, but like, right. I, haven't had the, I, haven't, I don't think, it's not like I'm refusing to play some of these, it's just I haven't had the chance. Mm. Yeah. So we'll organise it. Okay. We'll get you to play. Yeah. By Jove, it's number one. Number one, the best game in the world. What is it then? Hanabi. Hanabi, yes. <laughs> Hanabi is a sort of, un, like, you wouldn't think it would be the most amazing game in the world because it's just a little card game, particularly when I got these sort of big, heavy, thematic games uh, sort of prior to it on the list. Unassuming, that's the word I'm looking for. Um, essentially, it's the one where you have a hand of cards, but you can't see your own card. It's cooperative, which I really like. You can notice about quite a few of the games in the top 10 have been cooperative, but you are trying to play numbers, like the cards that have got different coloured suits with numbers, and you're trying to play one, two, three, four, five in each of the coloured suits out into the middle. But on your turn, you're trying to give information, clues if you like, to other people around the table. So you could tell them maybe they've got two threes in their hand, or these two cards are red or something. There are strict rules about what kind of clues you can give and what you can't give. If Once you think you know enough information about one of your cards in your hand, you can try and play it. And if it goes in the right place, that's great. If it doesn't, you kind of discard it and you lose it and you lose a life. If you lose three lives, you're out. Um, or you can kind of discard cards to get the clues back because you've got a limited number of clues that you can use to tell people information. And once they're gone, they're gone. So you have to discard cards sometimes just to get the clue back, even if potentially you might really need the card. Sometimes just to get through the deck as well. Mm, no, yeah, one's, right. no one's got anything playable, so someone needs to throw it away. Yeah. If the deck runs out, and this is usually how you lose, then that's the end of the game. You're trying to get, as I say, all the cards played. So a maximum score, I think, is with five different suits going up to five. You can get 25. You just add up the numbers on top of each deck. Um, but it's remarkably difficult to get 25. But the reason we fail is because, I would say, 99% of the time, we're making mistakes. I don't know that I've ever seen a game where we've played flawlessly and lost. If we manage to play flawlessly, which is very rare then we usually get the 25. It's possible. I think you could get some person at the end having all three cards that need to be played. and It's possible. They're on the bottom of the deck it's and they're possible. the ones that draw, draw them up. And, yeah. You'd get very close, I think, anyway. Um, but we, I should say, we've been playing this quite a lot this year, haven't we? We've kind of had a regular group at the cafe 
and we've um, played for hours. Yes, we'll just sit there like on a Saturday night and sort of get there at seven and play through to eleven o'clock. Um, but I'm always engaged all the way through, and we've been developing conventions, haven't yeah. we? So generally, if you give someone a clue, usually it means that they should be playing the card. So even if they don't necessarily know everything about the card, and you just tell them it's red, they will play the card. But the interesting thing comes from once you build up all these different conventions, it's like, if I tell him this, he's going to play the card, but I don't want him to play the card. And there are ways you can kind of tell someone else a clue that actually lets this person know that he has a card that he needs to be played. So it becomes so deep at this point. There are so many layers and levels to this game. And without that, you can't. I don't think you can get 25 just randomly. No, okay. no, no, no. You have to be very lucky. Yeah, yeah, that's right. But <laughs> I've loved discovering all the conventions, yeah. learning the conventions, developing our own conventions. It's just been so enjoyable. And what invariably happens, we, we get there, we sit down, we play a first game, someone makes some a couple of stupid mistakes that go, right, okay, that was our practice game, let's start again. We call it our cake game, don't we? Because we had this one time where Dave was eating cake and he just played abominably the entire game. And he said, oh, sorry, guys, that was my cake game. So now we always have a cake game at the start where we make then, a lot of mistakes. And then, so, so we have that game, then we go, and then we're, then we're doing all right, and then you can you can see when we're starting to... Drift Concentration off. drifts, yeah. doesn't it? We start thinking about other things, and oh, my goodness, what just happened? Oh, no, I've just misplayed, and it all goes wrong at that point. Um, so there's a limited amount of time we can play for, but yeah, I... I agree with you it is a fantastic game yeah to me i think it's probably the best game to learn with other players i think that's probably what what, te- what gets it there for you because i think the game yeah. sold off as an idea it is a still essentially a card game i can't my cards and you're doing and you play you've got to play one of the five cards of your hand yeah so the actual idea behind it isn't it's good but it's not revolutionary but it's the it's you say it's the learning and as your group as you grow together and make your own conventions and it it's like it brings you close together in a mm. strange way think of it as a longer version of the mind as in the mind's quicker as and you yes. slowly get used yeah. to other people but this you need a many many weeks and yeah. of, of as a group learning it to get to the top of it it's almost like a legacy game isn't yeah it? because you share that growing and learning experience together but it's not destructible so you can <laughs> complete keep doing it again and we do so there we go those are the top 10 games ever (laughs) how many did you get on your list I got 8 I've got an item that's very good Russian Railroads I missed Um, and then I had some on there that I thought you would definitely have on your list somewhere what else what did you so uh, last year I think you had X-Wing somewhere around the top 10 yes in fact I tell you if I look at my list there's a few things that have dropped off and then there's another one that I can't believe has dropped off was your former number 1 Nice, nice. Oh yes, right. yeah, that's right. So, well, how many did you get first? I only got five because I thought around some different, and I completely forgot. Did some silly mistakes like Marco Polo. Considering he if you look at the it, previous yeah. video, I've it. already mentioned it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, there so was some, some, some drop offs then. So ones that dropped off the list, um, not because they're not necessarily great games, uh, but for various reasons, just other games went higher. So Captain Sonar, which I think was on my list last year. Um, Hero Escape, Galaxy Trucker, Twilight Imperium, again just near misses a lot of these. Patchwords, uh, Patchwork, sorry. Werewords, which I've really enjoyed this year, uh, like a cross between 20 Questions and One Night Ultimate Werewolf, which sounds bizarre but it works really well. You don't actually have any social deduction games in the list, do you? No, but you see there's a couple that, that sort missed, of, yeah, yeah I got close. Um, X Wing, and I again, you had, yeah. you had, I don't know where it was last year, about 10th last year, was it? I don't think it was quite that high, but I've just not played it for quite a long time now. And although it's a great game, I think because it's moved on, there have been so many ships that came out, and then they released a new version of it, it's like, oh, I just, I'm not bothered about carrying up on with it. But actually, it's still a really good game, just because of how much I play it. Pulsar is another Euro I really enjoy, just missed the list. Uh, Magic Maze, I think, is a lot of fun. Uh, and astonishingly, Mage Knight. So when I first met Jonathan, his number one game was Mage Knight. It was. And honestly, the reason for this is because I've just played it so much. I have actually played it this year uh, more than once. But when I think about games I'd want to play, all the other games in my top 30 I'd rather play over Mage Knight at this point. Not because it isn't an amazing game. It is an amazing game. And if you've not played it and you like your heavy, thinky games, it's fantastic. But I've just played it so much... Um, the expansion didn't really do it for me, um, and there's only so many times you can play the base game in that sense. 
Um, and one other honourable mention here, which I strongly suspect will be in my top 30, probably very high in my top 30 next year, but I couldn't put it on the list because it hasn't come out yet, and that's Monumental. I played it at Essen. It's a big Civ building, dudes on a map game, and it's the best Civ guild building game I've ever played. Uh, it's one of the best dudes on the map games I've ever played. Um, it was on Kickstarter about a month ago, so it's going to be delivered next year, I think. Can't wait for it to come out. Um, but if you're, you're interested at all, I don't know if they're still doing late pledges, but Monumental is a really, really good game. So there, yeah, there we go. It's top 30 for another year. Uh, do let us know below in the comments what you think of the choices and are there any other games you think ought to be on the list? Something that would fit my tasting games that I've missed for some crazy reason? Do let me know. Uh, please like and subscribe, as always, makes a big difference to us. Thanks very much for watching. Um, See you again next time. Bye.